been a few weeks ago now when a lady asked me, she said, why? Pete, you're such a good teacher. Why do you always have to talk about poly or polygyny or polygamy? Why are you always talking about those things? Because most people don't want to hear that. And so I had to take the time to explain kind of in brief why what the motivation is. And obviously, uh, most of you who watch my channel recognize that there's certainly a passion here and a very particular focus, which may seem odd or unusual in the, uh, particularly in light of the fact that, uh, that Christendom does not care for this topic at all. But there are really some very, very good reasons why we must, must discuss polygyny. So what I want to do is I want to go through a rundown of, uh, of 10 reasons for me that come pretty much off the top of my head pretty quickly. Uh, scribble these down. I've got some notes. I would say that there's a, there's a paper that I wrote a few years ago called Why Poly? Why Now? It's available over on my um, notsav.com biblical marriage page. So if you were to go to biblicalmarriagenotsav.com and you scroll down on that page, eh, somewhere right around here, why poly, why now? And there are lots of other great articles here that are connected, a lot of other information, resources. I recommend you, uh, you dig into that if the rest of this makes sense. But let's talk about 10 reasons why uh, plural marriage or polygyny is something that we must discuss now, why why Christendom must pay attention to what's going on and why this is a topic that Christendom must discuss and must come to grips with. The first and most important reason is truth. What do, what do the scriptures actually say? What do the scriptures actually teach? I saw an interesting apologetics video that I'll be doing a response to just a day or so ago that The Muslim community knew more about what the scripture says with regards to poly or polygyny specifically than the apologist who was making excuses for why things have changed. The challenge, though, is that truth is truth. Scripture is truth. And either we stand on truth or we don't stand on truth. And so... The simple fact is we must take a look at what Scripture actually says about marriage and what truthfulness is about marriage. Because I can point you to one pastor after another that this topic utterly terrifies them because they know it's true and they know that it is a difficult, difficult subject to broach because we have so painted ourselves in a corner with a false doctrine called monogamy only or one man, one woman that is nowhere found in Scripture. So truth is the number one, number one victim of avoiding polygyny. You don't even have to participate. Simply bring the subject up and find out how truthful people really want to be. I think the number two reason is sanctification. Um, Now, I'm going to go through multiple multiple reasons here, some that are very practical and some that are uh, theological. This would be considered, I guess, a theological reason. But sanctification, according to Scripture, is the process of making one set apart, or to use a, a, a common word in Christianity, to make one holy, okay, or sanctify, purify, okay? And sanctification is the process of revealing sin in the heart and removing it. And one of the things that's fascinating about the word polygyny is just bringing the subject up reveals jealousy, anxiety, manipulation, control, anger, pride. There are all kinds of things just bringing the subject up. Uh, I would say for men, Um, And we'll talk a little bit later on about feminism. But I would say for men, if you want to find out whether or not you are the head of your house, whether or not the house is following you, just say the word, one word. And just like that, you'll know whether or not you are the man of the house. 
because pretty quickly, I know from three states away, sometimes I can see World War III blow up just because the word got mentioned. It's amazing. The third reason that this needs to be discussed is for the sake of women. And I know a lot of people are going, wait, aren't women the ones that are hurt by this the most? And actually, that's false, completely false. Uh, we have it entirely upside down. It's the man who has to make more sacrifices, who has more responsibility, who has more to take care of when, uh, when he's in a polygynous situation. And women are actually the beneficiaries. We are living in a society right now where hypergamy among women is a hotly debated topic. Women wanting to marry up. And it's always been that way. Throughout history, it's always been that way. Because a woman is designed for um, building a nest and caring for young. That's uh, the, the, the way that her body is designed, the way that her um, emotional, intellectual structure is. Uh, she's designed to care for and, uh, and tend young. So her primary thought process is, where does she get security? Where is she going to get the best provision? Where is she going to get the best protection? Um, all of those things. And so it's almost always, always looking for a man of higher status, a man of higher income earning potential or, or actively earning, uh, etc. And in our culture today, we literally live in a culture that is polygynous, in a backwards sort of way. What we have is serial monogamy. And in serial monogamy, essentially what we have is we have women that will bounce from one man to the next man to the next, always looking for a better option. And, in, and scripture is in no way designed for a woman to be able to switch men or to, uh, you know, to hunt in that regard while sleeping around. So for the sake of women, uh, one of the great myths is that, well, there's you know a one-to-one -one ratio between men and women, and therefore it's not necessary to have uh, polygyny on the table. But that is false. A quick and simple study of um, censuses throughout history, and uh, particularly those that have been recorded here in the U.S., you find that women, marriageable women, always outnumber marriageable men unless some external force like a one-child policy in China where baby girls were killed for the sake of, of having the more prized baby boy. Except for circumstances of that sort, marriageable women always outnumber marriageable men. Therefore, you have an unusual cocktail in uh, culture, in society, wherein the women... Uh, the larger number of women are hunting for a man and are willing to, uh, sort of like free radicals, try to break him loose from whatever pair bond he already has. The reason that women are uh, more numerous than men are several. Number one, baby boys die at a higher rate than baby girls uh, due to sudden uh, to crib death or sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, baby boys or young young boys do more dangerous things. All you need to do is see them riding motorcycles and climbing trees and playing with chainsaws and knives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so they manage to injure themselves. Boys, uh, young men tend to uh, go off to war. That's the that, that's who primarily fights battles. That's who fr primarily uh, is involved in the drug scene. Is primarily involved in um, other situations that place them in prison, or maybe they make a decision and move towards homosexuality or something of that, uh, ultimately removing themselves by many number of different ways, some of them very creative, from the marriage pool, further exacerbating the difference between the marriageable women and the marriageable men. And so for the sake of women, it's necessary to have polygyny on the table because it gives every woman options. No longer does she have to hunt the bottom of the barrel, um, or it, no longer is she limited just to what's available in the singles market, but instead uh, a, a woman has the ability and the option to search on a, on a larger, broader range for a man that is suitable uh, as a, that she can be a suitable help meet to and that she can uh, support and follow and be part of his family. 
A fourth reason, and some would find this to be theological, some would find this very practical, but a fourth reason is going to be the restoration of Kol Israel. And Kol Israel means all Israel. Israel, uh, for those who follow my channel, for those who have looked particularly at some of the older things that I've done, book that I published, uh, Ten Parts in the King, The Prophesied Reconciliation of God's Two Witnesses, available on Amazon, you will know that Scripture prophesies the restoration of Israel, uh, the house of Jacob, the house of Israel and the house of Judah combined, those two together. It prophesies the, the restoration of those into a single kingdom with the Messiah at the head more times even than the prophecies dealing with the Messiah. And so the restoration of Kol Israel demands that um, we move back in the direction of keeping the commandments as God wrote them for his people. Uh, anybody that reads the New Covenant, if you will take off your church lenses and read the New Covenant, it says it's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it says that he's going to write the Torah on our hearts. And that's stated not once or twice, but three times in Scripture. We find that not just in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, in a long plea to Ephraim, the house of Israel that has been cast out but will be gathered and brought back. We find the new covenant there, but then we find the new covenant cited twice, chapters 8 and chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, and in both places it says the law will be written on our hearts. And if it's written on your heart, that means you walk in it. It doesn't mean that you've got something written here that you don't actually carry out and perform. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the feet walk, so on and so forth. And so very clearly, um, in order for the restoration of Israel and in order for the fulfillment of the new covenant, we must be walking out the fullness of what the Torah has. And the Torah clearly allows for... Um, and in cases requires polygyny. The fifth item would be the restoration of Western civilization and uh, or uh, Western culture. I would say that I don't think it's possible to have or to restore what we have at this point without going completely back to the roots, completely back to the basics. And the basics um, of culture and Western civilization, while a, a significant portion of it, including monogamy only, are rooted in Greco-Roman law and Greco-Roman tradition, the fact is we claim to be a, a Christian or, or founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Well, those principles can only be found one place, and that's in the Torah. Therefore, in order to restore the culture, we can't simply remove some of the bad things that we don't like. We've got to, just like uh, a full body off restoration of a really nice old automobile or uh, old piece of furniture, everything has to be stripped down. We've got to take all the barnacles off and remove the garbage, the tradition, the junk that we've inherited from paganism, from Greco-Romanism, and from all the other cultures along the way through which, uh, through which the house of Israel has trooped. And there's something that you need to go back and study as well. So there is no way to restore our culture without fixing the marriage cocktail that I previously referred to, without uh, removing no-fault divorce, without removing... Um, egalitarianism and, and completely removing the uh, crazy monogamy only or the result of monogamy only stuff that we have here that's also tied to feminism. And that leads us to our sixth point. The sixth reason why we must study, we must grapple with, we must wrestle with polygyny um, is it is an antidote to feminism. There is not a fix or a repair to go back against feminism. Simply touting masculinity does not fix feminism. The antidote to feminism, to, to reversing and repairing that, is to restore headship and patriarchy. To understand that patriarchy is the foundation for culture. In fact, if you go do some study, what you will figure out 
is that feminism destroys. There is nothing that feminism finds that, that it does not want to destroy. Ultimately, feminism is about destroying woman as much as it is about destroying man, destroying culture, and everything else. The way that the, the reason that this is done, and let me give just a real quick sideline issue here. I had this discussion yesterday with one of my sons, is the fact that women and men are built differently. We're, we're designed differently by the Creator. And part of the design for woman, as I previously mentioned, is to care for young and to rear young. And so her focus, her design, the way that she thinks is wrapped around the nest and taking care of the nest and short-term thinking. And so it's not uncommon at all for a the, the thinking of a woman to be focused on the immediate and the very short term, um, which is why women are not generally suited very well for government or for leadership, because often the thought process is very short term, willing to sacrifice the future for the present. We find this particularly in budgeting and how things have been um, done in this nation for quite a number of years, but a lot of it comes as a result of the feminization of men and the, the feminism that has crept in at every level. Men, on the other hand, when they're functioning in their God-given role as patriarch and as head and leader, tend to be more sacrificial and tend to be willing to sacrifice things now for the future. They're thinking 10, 30, 50, or 100 years down the road. A real man that has focus and has um, a, an intention for the well-being of his children and grandchildren will be focused on those things necessary to make sure that the foundation is laid, even if it means costing something now. This is why the blood of the patriots are usually is usually male. So the antidote to feminism is to restore patriarchy. And there's nothing more patriarchal than polygyny, one man leading more than one woman, because by definition, the head is greater than those who follow. Uh, we can see this, the, a business owner is greater than all of the employees. Or as uh, scripture would tell us, a, a slave is not greater than his master. Rather, a master can have multiple slaves, but a, a slave cannot have multiple masters. You cannot have two heads. You'll be loyal to one or to another. So patriarchy, by definition, is the antidote to feminism. The seventh reason why uh, polygyny must be wrestled with. Another practical reason is it is the solution to fatherless wives or fatherless uh, or fatherless homes, and or and, and husbandless women, uh, and it is the the antidote to the welfare state where the government wants to be the head and the um, provider for women, thus uh, supplanting men in the role and the responsibility that they have. Uh, polygyny allows the opportunity for a man to care for more than one woman and to take care of the children of more than one woman, um, meaning that he can take and husband a large family himself, uh, meaning he can take under his wing widows and or other women with children who are freed up. There's a, there's a hot debate on whether or not uh, divorced women should be remarried or not. Um, I'll leave that for some other discussion at some other time, but the fact being that there are many, many divorced women who need a man in the home and their husband may or may not be available in that role where, or their former, I should say, husband is not available in that role. But this also leads immediately into reason number eight, tribe and clan building, or I should say clan and tribe, because typically you start with a clan, which is a, uh, a family that is expanded into a, a couple generations, and then a tribe grows into a very large and powerful body of patriarchs that are working together. Now, one of the reasons that monogamy only was instituted in Greco-Roman law more than 500 years before the birth of the Messiah was precisely because, according to Aristotle, that monogamy was the, uh, 
was good for the polis or the city state. The point being that if man couldn't build his own tribe or wealth and voting and power block through having multiple heritable sons and multiple marriages, then his loyalty would be transferred to the state. The fact is the state, uh, and when I talk about the state, I'm talking about the overarching government and not just the American, but any state hates polygyny because it allows a man to build a power block, which leads us directly into reason number nine. Another very practical reason is that polygyny is good for wealth building. Think about it this way. If a, uh, a, if a man um, can, it can compete and it causes him to compete for having more than one woman in order to make himself uh, desirable, one of his uh, issues is to be as successful as he can personally. And so it should cause men to step up and not simply be oxygen users, but instead uh, qualification for marriage means he's also going to have to be a well-educated, hardworking man, maybe business owner, certainly profitable, etc. So it begins, wealth building begins there, but then by being able to grow his family, he also has the ability to, to grow the income into the household depending on how he operates within his house. If a man has, let's say, um, two wives and one of them is really good at taking care of the home, loves taking care of children and that sort of thing, the second wife may prefer to have a have a professional career. Well, now you have two incomes plus you don't have child care expenses and you have the best of all worlds in that somebody who cares most for those children, a parent, is there overseeing taking care of those children at all times. So that's a means of wealth building. Another, if you look back at ancient Israel, wealth building, uh, Having, having multiple women gave the ability to have multiple sons, which increased the labor on the farm. And while this nation is terrified of talking about child labor, the fact is if children are being reared properly, they should be working alongside mom and dad. And what better way to do that than in a home-based business wherein they are learning skills, they're learning trades, they're learning the ability to generate wealth, and they're learning adulthood in the process and how to function in the world around them as a young entrepreneur, a young businessman. So this leads us kind of to the last of the 10 that I have listed here, and certainly there are more. I would love to hear if you if you know of some other ideas or if you've got some other thoughts to to put towards this, put them in the comments. I would love to hear your comments. would love to uh, love for you to like, share, and subscribe this. It helps to get the message out. The tenth reason that we need to be looking at polygyny, why it is so important, is because it helps us understand theology and eschatology. The fact of the matter is, I can prove this. Go look at my video called Two Brides, One Stone. It's a teaching. Um, all of Scripture is a polygynous love story. It's the love story of Yah, God, and his two brides. He says at least four times in Scripture that he has two brides, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 33, and Ezekiel 23. And he's very intentional when he says that to let us know that he viewed Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, as two brides before they ever left Egypt. Because I know a lot of people will say, oh, that didn't happen until Solomon or after Solomon with Rehoboam. Others will back up a little bit and say, oh, no, no, no. They, they were viewed themselves as two different brides somewhere around uh, Saul and why he had to, had to work to pull the tribes together. And David had Judah and Saul had, you know, everything else. Uh, you know, the house of, um, of Israel pursued one of Saul's sons for a short period of time. But that's just not true. Before Mount Sinai, God viewed Israel as two brides, and he says so very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 23. 
it's inter- it, it, it's important for us to understand theologically how God thinks, how he treats his people, what the framework is for how he functions with his people and what his purpose is by understanding his two brides. But the second and more important reason is that it helps us understand eschatology. Christian eschatology and Jewish eschatology is is built on the premise of one bride, each of them considering themselves to be the bride and the other not to be the bride. And yet, if you go study it out, over and over and over in spades all through Scripture, we're clearly told about the house of Israel, the house of Judah, the return of the house of Israel, the fact that the house of Judah itself, though unfaithful, was always the keeper of the Torah and will see the Messiah in the end and come uh, in that regard. And this is the story of two brides that have been at war since, I'd say, nearly since the beginning. Um, and it's because they refuse to obey their husband and refuse to love their neighbor as themselves. And those really are the major issues. And so if you go study and understand um, who those two brides are, how they're supposed to function, what God's purpose is for each, they have different roles or different responsibilities in him accomplishing his larger purpose of taking the Messiah to the ends of the earth and scattering the seed of Abraham and then collecting it all back into his kingdom, his storehouse. When you understand those things, you understand how central, how critical properly understanding marriage and polygyny specifically is to understanding all of Scripture. So what we've just gone over is we've gone over 10 reasons why we need to take a hard look at and process and wrestle with polygyny. I'm not saying you have to go do it. Now, there are men that I believe absolutely are called. In fact, a fantastic book by Clyde Pilkington Jr. called The Great Omission. I will put a link down in the um, down in the comments. But one of the One of the great points that Clyde makes in his book is that not only is God polygynous and his relationship with his people polygynous, we see that with the Messiah talking about the five, the ten virgins and five that come into the, into the wedding chamber, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. We see that all through scripture. The theme runs from beginning to end. It's even well articulated by Paul in uh, the way that he writes um, the letters, the epistles that he writes, you can see that in a paper that I wrote called Paul's Perspective of Polygyny, available on academia.edu. I'll put a link for that below as well. But those, those places specifically let us know, and, and Clyde Pilkington's book specifically covers the fact that God creates some men with hearts that are capable of and prepared for taking care of more than one bride. Some men, I think, are created to be monogamous. Some are created to be polygynous. And some are created and called to be celibate. There is no uniform, perfect will for every man. Uh, It's ultimately what God has for each man, and it's finding what that is and then figuring out how he wants you to walk that out. And so when we look at David, a man after God's own heart, David had... uh, seven wives and ten concubines before um, he committed adultery. And that's the only thing that God ever calls him on and says that that's the one thing that he did that was really wrong. He said, David did everything right in the eyes of the Lord except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Go look it up. So that's ten reasons, and I would love to hear your comments and thoughts on that. So be sure to put those down in the uh in the comments below and uh, chime in. Let's hear the discussion. Let's hear a good rebuttal because I haven't heard one yet. Um, and let's see. Let let's hear what uh, what others have to say. Are there other good sources out there that are confirming this information? If there are, I'm happy to share the stage. Anybody else? Put those down in the comments below as well. All right, folks. Um, absolutely for King and Kingdom. I bid you shalom. <laughs>